I've become very fond of Katerina. In many ways she resembles Beatrice from Much Ado About Nothing. Both women are quick to assert themselves verbally, much to the amusement of watching men. Both women are quick-witted, equal matches to Benedict and Petruchio when it comes to dishing out quips and sexualised banter. Both end up apparently happily subdued following their respective marriages. And yet for me, Katerina has become the far more interesting character. How is it possible not to be fascinated by a woman who ties up her sister, breaks the head of a man disguised as a musician, and at the end of the play commands other women to place your hands below your husband's foot? So, let's explore the presentation of Katerina in The Taming of the Shrew. This is Schofield on Shakespeare. It is important to note that, technically speaking, Katerina is found not in the main play, but a play within the play. The Taming of the Shrew starts with a group of hunting lords discovering a drunken oaf by the name of Christopher Sly. As is often the case with a Shakespearean comedy, an elaborate deception is devised, here in which the lords dress Sly up as an aristocrat, allocate him a beautiful wife, a page dressed up as a woman of course, and claim that the notion that he is a common man is nothing but a strange lunacy. After some initial struggles, Sly seems happy to be taken in, who wouldn't be, and sits down to watch a group of players act in a play aimed to frame your mind to mirth and merriment which bars a thousand harms and lengthens life. Katerina is the star turn within this play within a play, hence the overall title of The Taming of the Shrew. So, what are we to make of all this, and should it influence our own reaction to Katerina? Certainly, the alliteratively memorable quotation about mind, mirth and merriment suggests that we shouldn't take what follows too seriously. Not only has its artificiality been reinforced by the initial presence of Christopher Sly watching the action with us, but the fact how we should react and the life-lengthening benefits of reacting in this way has been prescribed. However, the problem with this is that Christopher Sly quickly disappears from the action. Following the start of the play within the play, he delivers just two lines at the end of Act 1, Scene 1, indicating enjoyment of the proceedings, never to be given stage directions or lines again. And so this is not like the short Act 5, play within a play in A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is littered with amused comments by those watching on stage, the chief of whom delivers a kind verdict on the shambolic yet earnestly meant action at the end. The end of Act 1, Scene 1 aside, the taming of the shrew does not return to Christopher Sly and the scheming hunting lords, and so very quickly we forget about them, perhaps as Shakespeare did becoming absorbed by the actions and events of the play within the play. Indeed, in a 2013 Globe production, the actor playing Christopher Sly, Simon Paisley Day, doubled up as Petruchio, thus making it impossible to maintain a watching presence following the latter's arrival on stage in Act 1, Scene 2. And so, to return to the presentation of Katerina, does it make any difference that she is the main character of the play within the play rather than the play itself? Perhaps in some ways it does. Her first appearance is 50 lines or so into Act 1, Scene 1. Instructions about pleasing stuff and mirth and merriment are still fresh in our minds. Frankly, it is rather nice to be told that you can sit back and laugh without thinking too much, and so when Katerina comes on stage to be openly mocked and scorned by men, we are less inclined to make judgments or empathise especially. This is all a fiction for fun, we murmur, and we laugh along with the men on stage as they make lewd puns about her character and use imagery to liken her to a prostitute. 
and by the time we have forgotten about Christopher Sly and the fact we are watching a kind of fictional history, our reaction to Katerina has been fixed. She is a woman to be laughed at. And my goodness do the men on stage laugh at her. Baptista, Katerina's father, has declared he will not allow his youngest daughter Bianca to wed until her elder sister has been duly married off. And the consequent wordplay shows the extent to which Katerina is generally mocked and poked fun at. Following Baptista's suggestion that Gremio and Hortensio could court Katerina at your pleasure, Gremio puns to cart her rather, she's too rough for me. The transformation of court to cart implies that he thinks Katerina is more horse than ladylike. She should be harnessed like a horse into a cart to carry heavy loads to market. Moreover, contemporary audiences would have recognised the fact that prostitutes could be punished by a whipping at the cart's tail. And so this disrespectful, poor taste joke also questions Katerina's chastity. Certainly, the latter is deeply offended both by Baptista's invitation for Gremio and Hortensio to suddenly forget about Bianca in favour of pouring at herself and Gremio's insolent pun. She asks indignantly, I pray you, sir, is it your will to make a stale of me amongst these mates? A stale could have numerous meanings, including decoy, stalemate in chess, someone whose love is ridiculed for the amusement of a rival, and most pertinently in this example, prostitute. In Much Ado About Nothing, Hero is famously jilted at the altar after her fiancé Claudio and friends are duped into thinking she has been sleeping with someone else. Claudio's best friend and matchmaker-in-chief Don Pedro moans indignantly, I stand dishonoured that have gone about to link my dear friend to a common stale. And so whereas in Much Ado the term stale, meaning prostitute, is used by men to refer to a woman who is believed to have been sexually unfaithful, here in The Taming of the Shrew, Katerina uses it herself to resentfully condemn her father for so nakedly offering her up to market before two men who clearly do not even respect her. So Katerina is clearly not afraid of speaking up for herself. She is feisty and her language in this scene contains threats of violence. Following Hortensio's opinion that Katerina will never find a husband unless she were of gentler, milder mould, the latter reassures him that she would never be interested in him as a husband, but if it were, doubt not her care should be to comb your noddle with a three-legged stool and paint your face and use you like a fool. In other words, the only interest Katerina would show in Hortensio would be to beat him over the head with a stool, scratch his face until it bled and generally make a fool out of him. Such vehement outspoken outbursts result in the men distancing themselves even more from Katerina. They see her as unfeminine, almost inhuman, hence Hortensio's entreaty to be delivered from all such devils and Gremio's parting shot that she should go to the devil's dam, with devil's dam meaning devil's mother, someone thought to be even more evil than the devil himself. The arrival of Petruchio as a brazen wooer allows the audience to see a different side to Katerina. Petruchio isn't remotely put off by Katerina's feisty, apparently disdainful rebukes and unleashes a string of sexually charged lines which the latter is happy to develop and return. In Act 2, Scene 1, Katerina plays on Petruchio's use of the word moved within his proclamation that he is moved to woo thee for my wife. She retorts, Let him that moves you hither remove you hence. I knew you at the first, you were immovable. The seamless shifting of move, meaning compelled to act decisively, possibly with emotional motivations, to remove, and then to the noun movable, meaning a piece of furniture, but also an unreliable, changeable man, reveals Katerina's dexterity when it comes to manipulating language. These are not the words of a violent man-hater, only interested in hurling stools at male heads. These are the words of a woman who is relishing the spark and energy of early courtship. Petruchio enjoys the exchanges too. Following Katerina's use of imagery, he lines up a punchline by asking, why, what's immovable? Katerina duly responds, a joint stall, 
And so Petruchio quips triumphantly, Bowers hit it, come, sit on me. Katerina deftly bats away this sexualized come on with a line, asses are made to bear, and so are you. To which Petruchio cries, women are made to bear, and so are you. From joint stalls to sexual suggestions of heavy petting, from the suitability of donkeys or stupid men, the carrying loads to, to the natural order of a female being Im impregnated. The speed at which the couple twist and recharge each other's language is breathtaking. For the first time in the play, Katerina is engaging with another character on an equal footing. Whereas in Act 1, Scene 1, her father embarrassingly tried to leave her alone with two men who had repeatedly made jokes at her expense and likened her to the devil, in Act 2, Scene 1, Petruchio wants to be with her. Whereas the other characters, including her father and younger sister, fear and have no idea how to handle her feisty, plain-speaking vehemence, Petruchio sees it as an opportunity and a challenge. Now, modern audiences in particular may well feel uncomfortable with some of the tactics used by Petruchio to tame Katerina, and I will explore these tactics later in the video. But it is important to clearly outline what Katerina's life was like prior to Petruchio's arrival. Her father seems to favour Bianca, thus breaking every parent's code that all children should be treated at least with a semblance of equality. She doesn't get on or trust her sister, and I have already discussed the way Bianca's suitors refer to her. Within this context, it is no wonder that Katerina decides to spend time engaging with a man who is prepared to give her positive attention and talk exuberant, flattering nonsense. So, in the early stages of The Taming of the Shrew, Katerina comes across as a gutsy, full-blooded, isolated figure. When she meets a man who is equally gutsy and full-blooded, the initial effect is a volatile equilibrium, characterised by tit-for-tat puns and sexualised banter. However, this effect is short-lived. Petruchio, the only man prepared to spend time listening and talking to Katerina, uses the knowledge acquired during these conversations, I hesitate to use this word as it makes them sound rather civilised, to outwit and outmanoeuvre her. With Petruchio having made his intentions to marry Katerina Clear, Baptista, Gremio and Tranio return tremulously to the stage to find out whether the hell-bent wooer's advances have been accepted. Katerina quickly resorts to the behaviour expected of her, violent curses, in which she roars sarcastically about Baptista showing her a tender fatherly regard to wish me wed to one half lunatic, a madcap ruffian and a swearing jack. However, Petruchio silences Katerina with a veritable stroke of genius, claiming that tis bargain twixt us twain being alone that she shall still be cursed in company. In an instance, Katerina's voice is silenced, and effectively she is trapped, or freed, depending on your perspective. If she continues to complain about Petruchio, her father and friends will put it down to wanting to keep up her usual appearances and behaviour. The logic here is that shifting so suddenly from vehement feminist to loved-up lover could leave her open to astonished, good-natured ridicule, rather like Benedict finds out to his cost in Much Ado About Nothing. The question is, is Katerina genuinely complaining about a proposed match with Petruchio, or is she merely living up to the behaviour expected of her? The answer is difficult to ascertain, but the fact Katerina says nothing else following Petruchio's outlandish claim and departs the stage with him to the lines, we will be married a Sunday, may imply that she secretly quite likes the idea of the proposed match and may feel liberated from the chains of her past persona and dreary home life. Movie versions of the film have varied considerably in their approaches to this scene. In Jonathan Miller's 1980 BBC television version of the film, starring John Cleese as Petruchio, Katerina looks gobsmacked following Petruchio's hushed claim that they've hatched up an agreement between them not just to get married, but for her to maintain her usual cursed act in public. Gobsmacked, and dare I say it, not totally scandalised by the idea. Tis bargain twixt us twain being alone. The 
that she shall still be cursed in company. Oh, I tell you, it is incredible to believe how much she loves me. Oh, the kindest case. She hung about my neck and kiss on kiss she vied so fast, protesting oath on oath that in a twink she won me to her love. Katerina is positioned in the front left of the shot so that her reaction to her future husband's words can be microscopically gauged. She cranes her neck so that she can hear every word of Petruchio's speech. And although she rushes closer as if to protest when he says, Till incre tis incredible to believe how much she loves me, she doesn't say or do anything and instead takes time to consider the consequences of these words, i.e. that she may very soon be married and embarking upon a completely different stage of her life. By contrast, Sam Taylor's 1929 production builds on the induction introduced premise that the action in the play within the play should frame your mind to mirth and merriment. Petruchio talks of how much he loves Katerina and as he does so, his loved one whips him with outraged force. It is terrible to believe how much she loves me. She hung about my neck, and kiss on kiss she vibes so fast, protecting her devotion that in a twink she won me to her love. These two productions deal with the same scene in completely different ways, but in some ways the effects are similar. The viewer doesn't unduly worry about the fact that Petruchio is steamrolling Caterina into a marriage without her verbal consent. In the 1929 production, we laugh at the extremity of Caterina's behaviour. We hear loud cracks every few seconds as the whip lands on Petruchio's back, who continues his speech about her extraordinary love regardless, rather than fret about her love of consent, her lack of consent. And in the 1980 version, we observe Katerina's body language, her intense listening, her failure to offer objections in verbal form, and sense that she might not be completely appalled by the idea of a union with Petruchio. Indeed, Katerina's words on her wedding day, as she faces up to the possibility that Petruchio may not turn up, imply that she has rapidly come round to the idea of a new life with this dogged, determined, not afraid to be different man. In Act 3, Scene 2, she shows her vulnerability as she envisages the humiliation of being jilted on her wedding day. Now must the world point at poor Katerina and say, lo, there is mad Petruchio's wife. If it would please him, come and marry her. A few lines later, she exits the stage weeping and mourning, would Catherine had never seen him though. These are perhaps the only genuinely sad lines in the entire play. Katerina's referencing of herself in the third person heightens the sense of tragedy and reinforces the passivity and dependence of the role played by women to be married during Shakespeare's time. There is nothing that Katerina can do at this point but limply and impotently wait for Petruchio who may or may not arrive. It could be argued that Katerina's lines primarily reveal pride and fear of public humiliation. However, the fact that so superficially strong a woman leaves the stage weeping must also reveal that she has developed some kind of emotional connection with this extraordinary man brain rudesby, full of spleen. In short, she may well have fallen in love. Petruchio does turn up, of course albeit dressed rather peculiarly and disrespectfully. The couple's initial wedded life is characterised by his persistency in modelling the folly of extreme, unmeasured, confrontational behaviour. Arriving back at his home with his new wife, he screams abuse at his servants for apparently serving up burnt meat. How durst you villains bring it from the dresser and serve it thus to me that love it not? There, take it to you, trenchers, cups and all and the stage directions reveal that he throws the foods and dishes at them. Such extreme behaviour mirrors some of Katerina's actions earlier in the play, tying up her sister in order to demand truth about which suitors she loves best, for example, or off stage breaking Hortensio's head and thus indirectly implies a degree of compatibility between the new couple. Petruchio out Catherine's Catherine and so perhaps the two do make a good match. 
But there is no question that Petruchio's tactics involve a degree of cruelty and misogyny, especially for modern tastes. Act 4, Scene 1 ends with a soliloquy in which Petruchio reveals that he is acting politically. He is deliberately behaving in a statesmanlike, prudent way in order to achieve his own means, which is presumably control over his wife and a comparatively tranquil existence. Melodramatic tantrums and table turning has meant that Caterina has had nothing to eat. Petruchio reveals, My falcon now is sharp and passing empty. Until she stoop, she must not be full gorged, for then she never looks upon her lure. Petruchio's words compare Caterina to a bird of prey and suggest that he will ensure she remains sharp, famished, in order to facilitate her metaphorical movement towards her lure the apparatus used by a falconer, i.e. himself, to restrict and restrain his bird come wife. In this imagery, Petruchio is the bird trainer, Caterina is the bird to be trained until she can follow his instructions. What should we make of this? One perspective is that Petruchio's language is outrageous. What gives him the right to torment and toy with his wife in this way feminists might bellow? How dare he nakedly and brazenly starve her until she follows his every whim? I have some sympathy with this view, although the audience's reaction is likely to vary depending on the production. For example, the clip we saw earlier from the 1929 version shows Caterina cracking a whip repeatedly on Petruchio, merely for being persistent as a wooer. Surely extreme measures, if necessary, of a misogynistic bent are needed to convert this woman to civilised behaviour. Plus we need to think about the nature of drama. Are we intended to think solely and compassionately about Katerina as a human being, or should we sit back and enjoy the merry mirth of a caricature who happens to be female being transformed from brute to normality? Petruchio is ultimately successful in taming Caterina, or he certainly thinks he is. His final triumphs include getting Caterina to label the sun, the moon, in order to follow his instructions, to kiss him publicly, and to come to him immediately following his calling for her. In the latter case, Caterina shows herself more obedient than two other women, including her initially so attractive to the men sister, Bianca. Her final extraordinary speech sees her rebuking the other women for not showing the appropriate amount of obedience to their husbands. This speech ends with these remarkable lines. Place your hands below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if he please, my hand is ready, may it do him ease. The suggestion that women should place their hands below their husband's feet to show their duty is an incredible vault face from the beginning of the play. What should we make of it? One interpretation is that it is such an extreme, over-the-top suggestion that it cannot be taken seriously. Petruchio may be taken in, as shown by his delighted, why, there's a wench, come on and kiss me, Kate. But no one else is likely to interpret such slavering nonsense as indicative of a desperate, permanent desire for subservience. Is Katerina merely using flattering language to lull her husband into thinking he is the man in charge with a capital M, only to manipulate him in the future to get her own way? Possibly, but I'm not sure there is much evidence in the, in the text to suggest this. Or is Katerina so in love that matters of who's in charge and who isn't doesn't matter so much anymore? At last she is away from the claustrophobic clutches of her father and is with a testosterone fueled man who regularly proclaims his love in extravagant terms. In Zeffirelli's 1967 version of the play, Elizabeth Taylor is magnificent as Katerina. She appears to be genuine as she delivers this final speech. That said, there is also a sense of her enjoying the drama of holding a stage enraptured by such an unexpected speech. Have a look. Unable worms. Come. My mind hath been as big as one of yours. My heart is great, my reason happy more to bandy word for word and frown for frown. But now I see our lances are but straws. Come and place your hands below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if he please. 
My hand is ready. May it do him ease. Why, there's a wish. Come on and kiss me, Kate. In this version, you wonder whether Katerina is motivated at least partly by her desire to get one over on the other two women in public, especially her previously saintly sister, Bianca. She vigorously drags them up, outdoes them as they kneel with her shiny eyes and fabulous cleavage before completing the virtuoso performance with a splendid smooch. She's finally become the number one woman and everyone is there to witness it. No matter that she's had to talk a load of cobblers to gain this position, there is time enough to manipulate her husband for her own devices in the future. Mary Pickford's Katerina seems less genuine in the 1929 production. Or seek for rule, supremacy and sway where they are bound to serve, love and all day. <laughs> this Katerina is far more theatrical. When delivering the line about seeking for rule, supremacy and sway, she raises her right arm in mock heroic salutes, whilst there is a huge pause and artificially vehement head nodding between serve love and obey. That combined with the conspiratorial wink at Bianca, reveals unequivocally to the audience that this Katerina may be saying what her husband wants to hear at this moment, but in the future she will most certainly not be obeying him on things that matter most to her. So overall, what do we make of Katerina Baptista? Well, she starts to play as a shrieking shrew, probably unhappy at her current life with her father and sister, Although apparently repulsed by Petruchio's behaviour, her language during their exchanges reveals a degree of attraction, and she is genuinely devastated when it appears he may not show up for their wedding. Her early days as a married woman are miserable, as she witnesses the negative effect of unnecessary confrontation and verbal violence. In the end, she seems to place married harmony above all else, as shown in her extraordinary final speech. However, as to whether she means it or not is anybody's guess, or at least down to directorial interpretation of the performance you are watching. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production exploring the presentation of Katerina in The Taming of the Shrew. Many thanks for watching. <laughs>